The long peace is held for 80 years. There hasn't been a major war between industrialized powers since World War II. However, the specter of war has always hung over us, like a horrifying sword of Damocles, ready to slit our throats. The world is already facing incredible geopolitical tension. This is for a variety of reasons that I covered in this earlier video in this series of videos I'm making about modern politics. This video exists to discuss what would happen if war were to break out, not why or how it would break out. What would happen if the unthinkable were to occur? Who would fight? Who would win? How would the war be fought? The answers will be horrifying. Why just hear about World War III if you could also play through it as well? This video is sponsored by Conflict of Nations, which is a free online strategy game that gathers millions of players worldwide. You fight up to 64 other players in real-time games that could take weeks to complete. The game is set in the early 21st century and features modern-day weaponry and technology. The goal is to conquer the world with whatever means you choose. You grapple in challenging player versus player battles, and I've just got to say, the level of detail in this game is just incredible. Connect with other players on Discord where you can use diplomatic skills to forge alliances. This game is also cross-platform, which means you can play it with the same account on both PC and mobile phone. If you click the link in the description, you can join this channel's special game for the first viewers, which you can get to by typing the right name and password. Also, get the What If Altis special promo, which is, if you click the link in the description, you can get 13,000 gold in a one-month premium subscription for free. This offer is available only for 30 days, so move quickly. Start conquering the world today with Conflict of Nations. A rough map of the coalitions in the conflict would look something like this. People don't tend to view the world this way, but similarly to before World War I, the world is now broadly in two alliance structures, the Chinese and American. The politics we get fed in the news is often remarkably misleading to the actual nature of geopolitics. Countries that like to scorn America the most in public, like Western Europe or the Philippines, are actually firm American allies and getting more so. Similarly, China has hidden massive influence in poorer nations that rarely gets talked about. This map is open up to a great deal of interpretation. Russia and China, for example, are currently allies, but their partnership is tenuous at best, and it wouldn't surprise me if we see China and Russia go to war at some point before the mid-century. In the US-Chinese war, the Europeans and Russians might just sit out and watch from the side. Similarly, Turkey and Thailand alternate sides depending on the wind. Turkey and Russia have serious beef now, so I'm putting Turkey in the American camp for now. Similarly, Thailand is politically aligned with America, but culturally and economically is either close to China or a Chinese puppet, so I put them in the neutral category. China has lots of allies in places like Africa and South America, places like Venezuela, Tanzania, or Angola, but these countries are so poor, militarily weak, and removed from China, that it would be suicide for them to side with the Chinese in a conflict, and so these countries remain neutral. It's sort of similar to how Iran and Argentina were sympathetic to the Nazis in World War II, but stayed neutral. It doesn't matter how the war would break out. For the sake of the scenario, let's just say it does. Something goes horrifically wrong. It doesn't matter if it starts in North Korea, Armenia, the Himalayas, or Ukraine. A global conflict just starts. Something else I need to cover before we continue to the actual scenario is the role of nuclear bombs. I don't think any of the great powers would use nuclear weapons. First of all, most nuclear powers, including China, with the exception of the US and Russia, have treaties saying they won't use nuclear weapons unless their home countries are directly nuked first. Given the Chinese Communist Party's record of keeping promises, this isn't much in of itself, but nuclear war is in no one's self-interest. No one wants the end of humanity, and more importantly, everyone knows that no one wants it. If anyone is to use nukes, it would be one of the weaker and more insecure powers like Pakistan, North Korea, or Iran, but these wouldn't have enough ability to shake the human race. Restraint is actually the norm in military history. Total wars were only really waged in the 20th century AD and 3rd century BC for reasons due to advancing military technology. 
Chemical warfare was never used in the Second World War, noble casualties were remarkably low in the High Middle Ages, and the draft didn't appear until the Napoleonic Wars for this reason. Also, missile defense systems like FAD have gotten good enough they can knock missiles out of the sky at a 50% rate. A nuclear war in 1980 would cause a billion casualties. Now we're at 300 million. Hypersonic missiles might be changing this, but I'm not sure where we are in that arms race. Similarly, countries like China are at such a disadvantage in the nuclear arms race with the Americans that they would want to press their advantage in conventional warfare with their massive demographic and industrial advantage. We would likely end up with a treaty where, by which the Americans, Russians, and Chinese would agree not to nuke each other if neither side agreed to attack their countries proper. No bombs or troops in Honolulu or Shanghai. Finally, before we start, I want to have a note of modesty here. Every military prediction has gone pretty wrong. People far smarter than me with far more information than I have predicted practically every war terribly wrong. If heaven forbid a war were to break out, I would be very wrong in at least a couple things. The war would generally form a ring around the Eurasian continent. The Central Powers, as we can call them here for fun, would occupy the center of the Eurasian continent, while America, which we can call Oceania for fun, would control the oceans and maintain a coalition around the edges. In this part of the video, we're going to go through each theater of the conflict going clockwise starting in Korea. The Korean Peninsula would be a nasty fight. North and South Korea both have some of the biggest militaries on Earth, with, in sheer numbers, North Korea's being nearly as large as the United States. North Korea has an immense amount of missiles, and so could turn Seoul, a city of 10 million people, into rubble pretty quickly. This is the most heavily defended region in the world, and so the North Koreans would incur heavy casualties crossing the border. Massive Chinese armies would cross the border, pushing back the Americans and South Koreans by sheer weight of number. However, some factors make me think America would be able to stabilize a perimeter in South Korea. Firstly, the peninsula renders the Chinese advantage in numbers less as the Americans can maintain a tight defensive perimeter and use naval forces to control coastal regions. This plays into the American military doctrine's number one advantage, sheer firepower. Similarly, Korea is a mountainous region with brutal weather, continually shrinking the amount of areas America has to defend and giving the defenders yet another advantage. The South Koreans would likely fight like demons in order to protect their homeland, knowing what North Korean conquest would entail. Also, in the previous Korean War, the Chinese's main advantage was how low-tech they were. Chinese armies could climb mountains living off a bowl of rice and attack Americans from behind, or lose one-third of their men in a blizzard and still outnumber the Americans. As China has become a wealthier nation with a more high-tech military, this stopped working, thus making Korea's mountainous geography play even more into America's advantage. The Korean peninsula would likely stabilize into a horrific stalemate. An interesting alternative is that the U.S. would invade Vladivostok and Russia in order to create a second front to try to pick a fight further away from China, and thus one they'd be more capable of winning. I'm not sure how this would turn out. The main next theater would be Taiwan. A decade ago, I'd just say that America's overwhelming naval advantage would mean they just blow the Chinese boats out of the water. However, the Chinese have put massive effort into land-to-ocean defense systems, meaning I'm not sure if American ships could survive the Taiwan Strait. The projections I've seen from the Chinese government, for what it's worth, say the U.S. could no longer protect Taiwan after 2020. Considering how Chinese forces are massing in southeastern China, this seems plausible. My guess is that the Chinese would seize Taiwan in case of a war. Once in Taiwan, the Chinese would start to put in defense systems there in order to push their perimeter in the South and East China Seas further out, in order to start menacing the Philippines and Okinawa. One of the things people just don't believe when I tell them is that the U.S. and Vietnam are now good allies. This is since in the U.S., the Vietnam War was a seminal and traumatizing moment. Meanwhile, over the last 1,000 years, China's invaded Vietnam 27 times. This thousand years of continuous resistance to the Chinese, French, Americans, Japanese, and local Southeast Asian powers has made the Vietnamese a formidable warrior people, but would it be enough? No. Geography plays too much against Vietnam. Cambodia and Laos are Chinese allies, and the roads are good enough that Chinese can move troops into these areas and so attack Vietnam on every border. 
Vietnam is a very long and thin country, and so if you can split it in one place, the two main power centers in the far north and south are broken. Similarly, the Vietnamese heartland around the Red River lies very close to the Chinese border. The Chinese would actually conquer Vietnam, and like every time before, the Vietnamese would retreat into the jungle and fight a guerrilla campaign. Thailand is surrounded by Chinese allies and is friendly with China, and with the fall of Vietnam would switch sides to the Chinese, similarly to how they allied with Japan during World War II. Malaysia and Indonesia are generally American allies, and this would be cemented by them being coastal nations with coastal capitals. If these nations were to side against the Americans, the U.S. would just bomb their capitals into rubble. The U.S. technically be able to cement a defensive perimeter on the Kra Isthmus in Thailand, using the jungle terrain and peninsula to protect its position. In general, in the Far East, the Chinese would be able to take the initiative in the early stages of the war, since although their military is weaker by many metrics than the American, the Americans would be defending the entire world and the Chinese would be just focusing on East Asia, and thus would be able to concentrate their forces into that area. The next theater is India, an American ally, who would be fighting a horrifying defensive campaign. India is surrounded by Chinese allies, with Nepal, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Burma all Chinese allies. Bangladesh is simultaneously both a Chinese and American ally. Sri Lanka, being an island, would end up being an American ally in real terms. Also, India wouldn't let Bangladesh choose who they were going to side with. They would either strong-arm Bangladesh into their coalition or conquer it. However, all of this means India would end up fighting a three-front war. Pakistan would invade the northwest while the Chinese would launch an attack over the Himalayas. Much of this campaign would be determined by how big this attack would be. The Chinese have been building a lot of highways in this area, and would be able to build them quickly with their construction abilities, unless the Indians were capable of stopping them, that is. The U.S. could likely shell the crap out of Rangoon, thus rendering Burma pretty weak, but it would still be a useful vector for Chinese forces to attack eastern India. The Indians would likely stop them at a geographic choke point in the jungles of the Brahmaputra, where they stopped the Japanese last time. If the Chinese and Pakistanis could form a decent coalition and break into the North Indian Plain, the Indians would be done. Delhi lies in the northwest of India on the North Indian Plain. India is militarily and industrially far less effective than the Chinese. The U.S. would likely sink immense resources into keeping India alive. Much of this conflict is determined by how far India is developmentally now. Is Indian nationalism strong enough among the peasantry and lower classes that keep fighting a war with the loss of Delhi if that occurred? Could India gear up to form the massive military-industrial complex it would need, and would its roads be capable of supporting its military supplies? Would pulling people off the farms result in starvation in the cities? Factors like this would determine the outcome of this conflict. With both nations here having more combined population than the entire world during World War II, and with both sides using human wave tactics and prone to committing atrocities, just this theater of the war would probably be the bloodiest war in history. Going into the Middle East, things get more complicated, as they always do in that part of the world. We've already ascertained Turkey would be an American ally at this point. Turkey is the giant of this region, with an economy larger than Saudi Arabia and Iran, its major rivals combined, and the best military. Iraq is both an American and Iranian ally, and would likely end up siding with the Iranians. You would generally see a coalition of Turkey, Israel, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt against Iran, Syria, Iraq, and Russia. The Turks would be able to conquer Syria and northern Iraq, failed state to the most part. Iran and Saudi Arabia would get stuck in an intractable conflict. The Iranians would block off the Straits of Hormuz, thus killing trade to the Persian Gulf states, their rivals. The U.S., with too much in its plate already, would ignore this for now. Saudi Arabia likely wouldn't survive this total war, with a terrible military except for a couple elite regiments and barely having social cohesion now. The Turks and Iranians seem to have no grudge with the other now, and so I could see the two powers agreeing to not fight the other and partitioning the region. The Azeris and Turks would combine to crush the Armenians and would get stuck in an intractable campaign in the Caucasus with the Russians. No one makes progress in the Caucasus since the climate is so hellish. The only way the Turks would gain an advantage is by getting the Chechnyans, fellow self-governing Muslim sort of related peoples in the north slope of the Caucasus, to rebel against the Russians. 
Moving into Europe, the Russians would drive into Eastern Europe. This brings us to the very unclear point where I'm not entirely sure what Russia's military capabilities even are now. I've heard very conflicting reports where their military is either barely functioning or has regained most of their Soviet military projection abilities. The Russians' ability to show up is decisive here. Belarus being a Russian ally means that the Russians would be able to sever the Baltics and conquer them with relative ease. Ukraine similarly would be relatively easy pickings. I've heard it would take several months for America to move a full field army into Eastern Europe, and so the Poles would have to hold out until then. Whether they'd be able to depends on if the Russians would fully show their colors. In general, with a population and economy one-tenth China's size, the Russian front would always take a backseat to the Asian. I could see Crimea becoming a frontier. Like in the Crimean War, America and Turkey would control the Black Sea, and Crimea, being a defensible position on the Russian side of the sea, would be a perfect staging ground to strike into the soft Russian underbelly. Military technology would have a decisive effect here. I'm just not sure how. Every war in the modern world fought decades since the last major war is a complete unknown. People went into World War I projecting the trends of the Napoleonic Wars, of massive offensive attacks and massive toy soldier armies would just continue on a bigger scale, and they were oh so wrong. All the major militaries will go into this conflict thinking like World War II and they will all be very wrong. There's no good way to read exactly how technology will affect the war. On one hand, missiles could help the defense, with destroying any attacking troops or GPS allowing bombing roads so effectively that no one can muster attacking forces. However, communications technology also makes coordinating attacks, one of the forgotten major issues generals faced, so much easier. Similarly, the last major wars America has fought in, the wars in Iraq, demonstrate that modern technology has just made the Blitzkrieg more powerful. The only honest conclusion we can reach is that we just don't know. There are several things to consider, however. One of which is that when generals are in doubt, lives are lost. An aim of every military is to lose as few of their men as possible, and so when generals don't know what they're doing, lives are lost. I've read some estimates saying we would have casualty rates higher than World War I. A very cynical way of viewing it is that due to the immense population growth of the last few decades, human lives are getting to be a cheaper commodity, especially for nations like China or India. The bigger countries today can fight the Somme several times over and not bat an eye. Several new fronts would open up. Trump was mocked for creating the Space Force which was viewed as ridiculous. However, in real terms, it was actually a very smart decision. With practically our entire civilization wired through satellites, we have to keep them safe in order to keep our society alive. A new front will open up in space between rival satellites. Similarly, there will be a new front in digital warfare. With our lives so dependent upon the internet and computer networks, shattering your enemy's cyber defenses could be a killer move. This could result in shattering a rival nation's electrical or banking system, something people don't talk about as logic bombs, or coding bombs planted in another nation's vital systems that are waiting for wars to be turned on. The combination of logic bombs and missiles could shatter a nation's supply chain. This would make this war an especially nasty one to fight in the home front. For nations with massive food dependencies, the results could potentially be devastating. An interesting corollary to this is that much of modern military technology is exceptionally specialized, with only a few factories around the world capable of producing it and supported by highly complex parts. Knocking out these factories with missiles or systemic failures could result in delaying production of modern weaponry. We could end up with a war with some modern tanks, for example, and swarms of easy-to-make pseudo-World War II-era ones. When you consider that a modern tank can easily take out 12 World War II-era ones, it means we're returning in many ways to the Middle Ages, with a few knights cutting through peasant cannon fodder like butter. The social effects of this would be enormous in the long term. A positive side effect of this would be an immense technological revolution. We seem to be on the verge of multiple technological revolutions now, whether possibly biological, nanotechnological, robotic, or AI. Total wars have always put technological progress into overdrive as governments put massive investment into the military and people risk technologies that might not work. Coming out of this war, we'd be far more technologically advanced than we would going into it. 
However, the negative side effect of this is that troops in the battlefield would be faced with nightmarish technologies. It's hard to say what technologies in development will eventually see the front line, but we're currently seeing space-based lasers, robotic bee assassin swarms, StarCraft-style electric body armor suits, and invisibility cloaking technology all in some form of development. In general, if it exists in a science fiction movie, a military is probably working on it at some level. Robots are a very interesting thing, as things like missile warfare will be fought in matters of seconds and as leaders want less actual humans to die, the onus will be on them to rely on robots or things like drones. However, if human judgment is imperfect in war, robots who are terrible at seeing context would be even worse. Atrocities would skyrocket at a horrifying rate in the future war if robots are used as their ability to distinguish civilian from combatant gets worse. The central power is greater willingness to commit these kinds of atrocities with robots will give them a greater advantage. In the long term, the use of robots will likely end up becoming taboo after this war for the atrocities they commit. One thing that won't go away due to technological progress is the infantry. On the opposite side of the spectrum of the people who expect World War II again are the people who see that the infantry and conventional warfare will become redundant due to push-button warfare. This has been a common claim since the invention of the machine gun, which was supposed to make war so horrifying that it could never be fought again. This argument always misses and continues to miss two important variables. Firstly, that weapons tests in labs are always painfully inaccurate for the effects of terrain on a battlefield. For example, in World War I, artillery and poison gas were never able to completely wipe out the enemy like they did in tests. This is since, by hiding in foxholes and trenches, surprising amounts of troops were able to survive. Secondly, that the infantry is the only thing you can use to hold onto terrain, which ends up being one of the biggest parts of a war. You can bomb areas into oblivion, but you need the infantry to control them. There are several variables to determine who the victor would be, the first of which is how much the Chinese would show up. I've heard very conflicting reports on what the Chinese military's capabilities are. I've heard it's simultaneously very corrupt and has done a good job at reform. From my experience of having been to China, personal experience of dealing with Chinese systems and reading history is that the Chinese either completely fail by letting internal corruption and division eat themselves alive, or they bring their A-game and completely crush everyone else. This is the main deciding factor for a war. If China is capable of using its massive population and industry to full bear, they will win. And if not, they won't. China likely has immense potential industrial ability in a war, and a huge amount depends on how much the Americans can disrupt this and also retool American industry. As mentioned before, a similar situation exists with Russia on a smaller scale. On the American side, America will have to pick up the slack for their coalition for a while until they're mostly pacifist allies, like the Western Europeans or Japanese can pick up the slack. Although the Chinese have immense mobilizational abilities, the massive size of America's alliance means that they'd be able to win if everyone mobilizes. If America's allies can mobilize within the first year, and America has not lost a decisive defeat, the Americans will win. The Americans, for example, have nearly all of Europe as an ally, a region that has immense potential of militarized. In a good scenario, the Europeans would be able to pick up the slack in Europe and the Middle East, while the Japanese can do so in East Asia. The Turks become a full military power. Indians especially stay alive and are capable of fully industrializing. India is a decisive partner that will either disappoint or impress depending on their current developmental level. Arming the Europeans, Japanese, and Turks would have massive geopolitical effects after the war that I don't want to get into. This brings us to the ultimate failure of American policy in Europe, a European backstab. France and Germany are some of America's most independent European allies, actively supporting foreign policies against America's self-interest. These nations pull a general dislike of America by their populations. If the Russians were to crush America in Eastern Europe, these Western European nations, far enough away to feel secure, could create a deal with the Russians that would give the Russians Eastern Europe in exchange for cheap resources. This would end up being a complete collapse of the American position in Europe. China's biggest weakness is they're thousands of miles from their oil supply and can barely feed themselves. With America blocking their naval route, they'd strengthen their land route through Central Asia to the Middle East oil. However, this is a long, arduous, and tenuous supply line. The native populations in the areas in between don't really like the Chinese either, their leaders just want money. The US will support Islamist movements in Central Asia, including likely ironically the Taliban, in order to sever Chinese supply lines. 
Similarly, the Chinese would start to farm neighboring countries, especially in Russia, and extracting resources to feed themselves after the U.S. would blockade China. This brings up a major weakness in the Chinese alliance, that no one really likes China. The Chinese have a tendency to act in a very arrogant and unpleasant manner in geopolitics due to their thousands of years of hegemony. If the Russians were to face a crippling defeat to the Americans, and with the Chinese settling more and more of Far Eastern Siberia, I could see the Russians backstabbing the Chinese. Similarly, I could see the Central Asian regimes, already unstable and unpopular, collapsing due to populist anti-Chinese rebellions, angry at China leeching away resources and their boys dying in Pakistan for conflicts they don't care about. On a separate note, the U.S. may appear very divided now, but still has a good deal of civic pride and has a history of coming together in crises like Pearl Harbor, Fort Sumter, or 9-11. The U.S. tends to wear its problems very openly, so it tends to appear in worse shape than it really is. Similarly, American foreign policy and public opinion tends to have the emotional state of a teenager due to its Calvinist heritage and isolationist geography, alternating between immense self-guilt and loathing and extreme aggression and self-righteousness. If America was attacked, it would go from guilty to aggressive and self-righteous very fast. China and Russia are very patriotic now, but their forms of patriotism come from the loyalty populations that have had their leadership give them real physical benefits have. However, since these are autocracies in which the population has very little control or responsibility for the government, this could quickly transform into hatred if the war effort went badly. Due to the massive geographic regions involved and probably super high casualties alongside nuclear treaties, this wouldn't be a war ended by seizing the enemy's capital, but one in which one nation's will broke before the others. To summarize, America would win this war if it could mobilize its allies effectively, and if not, China would win. Without the help of its allies, America just can't get over the fact that there are four Chinese for every American, a kill ratio that's almost never been matched in history. Well, that was a cheery video. If you enjoyed it, please like, comment, subscribe, or stay tuned for additional content. Or alternatively, check out Conflict of Nations by clicking the link in the description, or my Twitter, or my Patreon, where I've got all sorts of cool maps as well as the first eight chapters of my history of the world. As always, thanks so much for watching and have a great day.